Okay. So today we will discuss about sorting and we'll learn all the algorithms of sorting and also uh, we will learn uh, basically how to implement them in Java and their complexity. Good. So we learned a little bit about sorting in the previous classes. We learned selection sort, we actually implemented insertion sort, uh, today we'll implement it again and we'll also analyze its complexity. And if you remember the algorithms that we have wrote for sorting, like insertion sort or selection sort, they were uh, uh, quadratic complexity. So today we'll learn how to basically write better algorithms for uh, com uh, sorting and also uh, better than uh, quadratic complexity, log linear complexity. We'll also learn a uh, radix sort, which basically we, the complexity for that is the radix multiplied with the number of elements in the, uh, in the set. We'll also learn ex uh, external sort for large files uh, that need to be sorted in memory. So what kind of data we sort? We can sort any kind of data. We can sort integers, doubles, characters, objects, strings, and for simplicity, for most of the lecture today, we will only consider integers because all of the methods that we learn for sorting apply to any other uh, uh, data structure array, uh, basically. Uh, the, the data that we are going to sort is going to be in ascending order. You can basically just change the operator greater than with less than, and you would get descending order. Uh, the data will be stored in arrays, and the other programs that we are going to write today are very easily uh, modified if you want to use an array list or a linked list. The Java API already contains many of the methods that we will discuss today for sorting primitive type values or objects that are comparable. So those methods are in the arrays class, Java utils arrays.sort, and in the collections class. So we start with insertion sort. So if you remember insertion sort works as follows. We start from the beginning and we consider the first element to be in the sorted order. And then the next element will be inserted in order in the previous prefix. So since nine is greater than two, it will be left in place because it will be two nine. Two nine is not sorted and the next element which is five has to be inserted in sorted order in the sorted prefix. So as we can see, five is greater than two, but it is less than nine. So we'll have to move five in the position of nine and nine move it to the uh, position of five. And then we have the prefix sorted two, five and nine. And we continue this process basically for every element we look at where it should be inserted such that it is in sorted order. So how do we do the insertion? It's quite, quite simple actually. So consider the case that we have two, five and nine sorted. So we want to put four in the sorted order. We save four to a temporary variable called current element. Then we start uh, uh, swapping elements from the end to the right. So nine will be, because nine is greater than four, will be moved from index two to index three. Since five is greater than four, we continue swapping uh, from five from index one to index two. And now since two is less than four, we can insert four in the sorted order. So basically for every element, we do this operation. We start, we take the element, we put it in the current value, and then we start comparing it with the current element from the end in the prefix. So we swap nine and then since five is greater than two, we insert five. And this process continues. We can see actually in the example that we have the prefix sorted prefix two, four, five, eight, and nine with the next element would be one. And for that, we need to swap to switch nine, one position to the right, eight, one position to the right and so on because they are all greater than one. And only at the end we would insert one into the first index. And this algorithm continues up to the end. Any questions? Okay. 
So how is this implemented? It's quite simple. We start with the second element, the element at index one, up to the end of the list. And then we want to insert the element at index i in that list into the sorted sublist from zero to i minus one. And how do we do that step? Basically, we save the element at index i into a current element variable. We have a, a, basically a loop that starts with i minus one and ends when k is greater than uh, zero. And every element, if the list of k is still greater than the current element, then list of k plus one is assigned list of k. So basically we do a, a right hand switch uh, from to the right. Uh, and the moment that this condition is not true anymore, it means that the current position list of k plus one can be assigned the current element. And if we put it all into one solution, we basically have this method which implements insertion sort. If you try it on a simple array, uh, either generated randomly or uh, created, uh, like in this case, is in line definition of the array, it will sort the elements of the array. And if you print list, it will print it them in sorted order, minus four, one, four, five, six, and nine. Uh, now, what's the time to execute for this uh, algorithm, the worst time complexity? The best time complexity is that the elements are already sorted. So every time when you compare an element with the previous element to it is in the is greater than and then you are in the right order. So best time complexity is O of n. Worst time complexity is the following. In the, in the case that we need to insert the first element in the sorted order, we basically need one comparison and one swap. For the last element, if it's the smallest element like we had in the case of one, we basically have to compare, that, compare it with every element one by one from the end to the beginning and to swap all of those elements one position to the right. So for the last element in the worst case, we would need n minus one comparisons and n minus one swaps. So the time that it takes to insertion sort in the worst case would be two in the case of the first element needed to be swapped a, a, a position, two plus a constant time to do that, uh, op those operations. For the second element, we would have to do two comparisons uh, and two uh, swaps. So basically twice multiply with two. And for the last element, we'll have to do twice n minus one operations, comparisons and swaps. So this is a, a arithmetical sequence. It's basically two multiply with one plus two plus up to n minus one. We give two as a common factor plus C mul multiply with n minus one. Uh, one plus uh, two up to n minus one is n minus one multiplied with n divided by two. We simplify two, we get n squared minus n plus cn minus c. And after we eliminate the non-dominating uh, values, we get that is a quadratic algorithm. And I actually implemented it in uh, Java. So insertion sort, I generated an array of uh, 100,000 elements. So I set the size to 100,000. Then I create an array of 100,000. I randomize that array. I basically create random values. So for all of the elements in the array, I assign A of I to math.random multiply with the length of the array, cast it to an integer, then uh, in a for loop, I print the elements if you want to print them, but I, let's take them out because we don't actually need to print them. And if we want to measure the time that it takes the, for insertion sort, basically uh, you save the current start time in milliseconds from uh, uh, Unix epoch time and the end time and you subtract n minus start and you add milliseconds. So insertion sort implements insertion sort. I have it 
here. It basically implements the algorithm that we just discussed. Iterates from the second element, saves the current element in the current element, and then it iterates from the end, i minus one up to zero, and uh, switches the elements uh, until uh, the element is not greater than the current element. So for 100,000 elements, it takes about four seconds. 3,924 uh, 3, milliseconds, so about four seconds. So basically, next algorithm is bubble sort. So that's a quadratic algorithm, the insertion sort that we saw. Bubble sort doesn't improve the complexity, but it's a little bit faster. And we will see that the reason is that we actually, uh, the bigger values bubble to the top all the time. So let's actually understand how bubble sort works. Basically what bubble sort does, iterates sequentially in the list and compares any pair of adjacent elements, uh, items, and if they are not in ascending order, so you have an element bigger and then a smaller element, you swap them. So the smaller one comes first. After the first pass, if you do this operation over every pair of elements from the beginning to the end with a sliding window, you are guaranteed that the last, ele the last element of the array is the largest element in the array because if it was at the beginning, it was swapped with the second element, then it was swapped with the third element and so on. So no matter where the largest element is in the array, it bubbles to the top. So that's why it's actually called bubble sort because large values gradually bubble to the top, the end of the array. After the second pass, basically you did this pass once up to the end, the biggest element is last, now you can do it up to n minus one, the previous to the last element. And the same thing happens. You start from the beginning, you compare the adjacent elements and you swap them if uh, they are not in the right order. And this guarantees that the second to last element will become the second largest in the array. So these bigger elements bubble to the top. Now, another name for bubble sort is sinking sort where basically the same idea applies that the smaller element sink gradually to the bottom. So bigger elements are bubbling to the top, smaller elements are sinking to the bottom. And uh, the implementation, basically the pseudocode is like this. You iterate from K equal one to the length of the array. Then from zero uh, for i equals zero up to the length of the list minus k, you disconsider the last elements because they don't need to be considered. If list of i is greater than list of uh, i plus one, uh, that means that they are not in the right order, so you need to swap them. You save list of i into a temporary variable, then you assign to list of i list of i plus one, and then to list of i plus one the temporary variable. So one optimization that you can do with bubble sort is that you don't need to do this uh, operation if it's not needed. So basically you do these passes through the array, but you should stop the moment that you didn't do any swaps. Because if no swaps took place in any pass, it means that basically the array is, is sorted. Every element is smaller than the next element and by transitivity of greater than is smaller than all of the following elements after it. So if no swap takes during a pass, then the elements are already sorted and you are done. And we can implement this. Basically, need uh, next pass is assigned true. For every integer uh, k from one to the length of the list and the next pass is needed, uh, then we assign to need the next, pa uh, next pass equal false. And then we, in the f we again have the for loop that iterates from zero to the length minus k. If list of i is greater than list of i plus one, then we do the swap and we assign to next uh, pass true. And here is an example. Basically what I'm doing here is an example of bubble source. So consider that 
our initial array was 2954881 and I'm starting bubbling through the array. So two is less than nine, they stay in place. Nine is not less than five, so we swap them, five and nine. Uh, nine is still not less than four, so we swap them. So in the next step, it would be four, nine. Uh, nine is still not less than eight, so we swap them. And then uh, nine is not less than one, so we swap them. So nine bubble to the top. Nine was basically the biggest element. In the next iteration, we repeat the operation. We basically look at the first two elements in the previous array. So two is less than five is okay. Five is not less than four, so we swap them, it's four, five. Uh, five is less than eight is okay. Eight is not less than one, so we swap them. And now eight is the, last the previous to last element and they are in sorted order. And we continue this. So now we take the previous array because we did at least one swap. So now two is less than four is true, so we leave it in place. Uh, four is less than five is true, so we leave it in place. Five is not less than one, so we swap them. And then eight is less than nine and we basically leave them in place. And five is less than eight and we leave it in place. So now we take this array uh, and we do, uh, do bubble sort one more time on it. So basically now we compare two with four and they are in correct order. Two, uh, uh, four with one and we swap them and then we stop because the rest of the elements were already swapped before. And now in the next step, because two is less than, is greater than one, we swap two and one and we get actually in the fifth pass, the sorted array. In the best case, the algorithm basically only needs n comparisons up to, n minus one comparisons up to the end because all the elements are already in order. In the worst case, which is actually a more like an average case because you basically get always arrays that are not ordered in any kind of way. You would need n minus one comparisons and uh, swaps for uh, the first step, the first phase, then n minus two in the second phase, then n minus three in the next phase and so on. So basically in each phase, you would have to look up to the uh, Kate element that uh, in the first case you would have n minus one, in the second case n minus two, you can this consider the last element and so on. Now again, this sum is n squared minus n divided by two, which is a quadratic algorithm. So the time is O n squared. And again, I implemented it, uh, except the swap in, I just noticed. So if we want to implement it, uh, this is bucket. Here we have the swap. Let's implement the swap correctly. So we need an integer temp, which is assigned swap of list, uh, list of i, list of i is assigned list of i plus one, list of i plus one is assigned temp. And this is basically the bubble sort. And if we run it, we probably will get similar type to a time with insertion sort. So let's run it. It's quadratic, so it will take a little bit of time. So it took about 14 seconds. So it's a little bit slower than what we expected for uh, basically bubble sort. Any questions up to now? If not, let me change the slides because you are going to use them. Okay, good. So the next algorithm that we are going to talk about is MERS sort. And MERS sort was invented by John von Neumann in 1945. 
It basically divides the unsorted list into n sublists, each containing one element. A list of one element is considered to be in sorted order. And then it merges the sublists uh, one by one uh, until there is only one sublist remaining. And this basically is in sorted order. So this is how basically divide and conquer is applied for merge sort. Now, basically you can consider that the sorting of the entire array is by splitting the array into two parts. And then those arrays will be split into two parts and those arrays will be split until you have a single element. Then this uh, elements are considered to be sorted because two as a single element is an array of one element that is sorted. So now we merge them and two arrays, uh, two uh, sorted arrays can be merged in the, in the uh, size of the array because basically we compare only the first elements. We compare two with nine, two will be smaller. So we put it at the beginning of the uh, result and then nine will be put next. And similarly, five with four, four is smaller, it will be put first, five it will be put second. When we merge these arrays, we always look at the first element. So two is less than four, we copy two into the result and then we advance the index in the first array with one position. We compare nine with four, four is smaller, so we copy it into the, into the next position in the result and we advance the cursor, the index, with one position in the second array. We compare nine with five, five is the smaller one, it will be copied and then we advance with one position in the sorted, in the second array. And now nine cannot be compared anymore, so it's just copied. So basically this is how merge works. You are considering two sorted arrays, you look only at the first elements and you insert the smaller one into the result and advance that index. And this is an example of divide and conquer because you divide the problem into smaller problems and then the conquering phase is the merging that at every step you merge the results on the two different branches into a single uh, result. So how do you merge two sorted sublists? And as I said, you look, you start with two indices, current one and current two in the two lists that you try to merge. You compare the values in those indices, two with one, the minimum one will be copied into the result. And then only current two, the index in the second array will be incremented with one. And now we compare two with six and two is smaller, so two will be copied and so on. Only one index at a time will, be, will advance. The moment that we reach with one of the indices at the end, all that we need to do is to basically copy the rest of the elements, the uh, elements of, those, of the remaining array into the result. And in the end, we should basically get to a position where both indices, current one and current two are pointing outside the, the result, the current arrays. And then in the current two, we would have basically, current three we would have the result array. So how do we implement this? Because yes, we can implement it in a, iteratively in, in a function that uses a stack but we have recursion in Java. So the way to implement it is basically to uh, copy, to sort half of the first array, sort half of the second array with merge sort and then merge them. So it's really, although in the image of divide and conquer, you're going to split the array until you get one element and then you start merging, that's, the way that we implement it is actually through recursion, that sorting the entire list will call sorting half of the list and the other half and then follow up by the merge. So really we are looking at the first step and we are looking at the last step in this uh, figure. The rest are done recursively. For sorting this, we are looking at the first step of splitting and then we are looking at the second step of merging the sorted lists. So when we implement it, this is the implementation. Basically, if the length of the list is greater than one, 
then we need to sort the arrays. So we create two halves. We create a new array of half of the elements and we copy the elements from the old list into the first half list starting at index zero. And the number of elements is list of length minus one uh, divided by two. And the, uh, the second half does exactly the same. It basically does merge sort of uh, the rest of the elements, the length of the list minus the uh, half of it. And that's the second half of the array. And again, we copy from the list, starting with the element with index list dot length minus uh, divided by two into the second half, starting from zero and the second half length. And we also merge sort that one. Finally, the merging step is basically the step in which we uh, merge the two sorted arrays into a new array. Okay. And again, I basically, and merge is the operation in which we merge two sorted lists. So list one and list two are sorted. Current one and current two are both set to zero. Uh, the, temp, the current three is also set to zero. That will be the result that will be put in this temp. Yes, it's on the same day. There was a question in the chat. Uh, while the current one is less than the length of list one and current two is less than the length of list two, the list one of current one, if it's less than the list two of current two, then the first element that will be copied into the temporary array, into the merged array, is the element at current one. And we increment current one with one. And similarly, on the other branch, we copy the second, the element from the second array because that's the smaller one. We execute this in a while loop until we reach one of the ends of the two lists, list one or list two. And then two more while loops are basically copying the rest of the elements from current one to the end of list one and from current two to the end of list two. And if you want the entire execution of this program, it's in the lecture, it's basically in the lecture notes. So for, an ex for this list, a random list that is created, uh, let's say that here it contains the elements 14, 12, uh, 2, 3, 2, minus 2, 1, 3, 6, 5. It basically sorts them into this sorted order. And if you run it on 10,000 elements, as we basically did the other examples, it takes 16 milliseconds. So it's the fastest of uh, the algorithms that we saw up to now. Bubble sort took four seconds, uh, 14 seconds. Insertion sort took uh, four seconds. Merge sort basically takes 26, 14 milliseconds, depending on how you run it. Okay. So now let's analyze the execution time. So T1, Tn denotes the time that it takes to sort an array of n elements using a merge sort. And you can consider that n is a power of two. Uh, you basically can consider that for any n, you can find the next power of two that is greater than equal with n. The merge sort algorithm, what it does, it splits the array into two halves. So it and sorts the subarrays using the same algorithm. So basically, the time that it takes to sort n elements is the time that it takes n divided by two elements plus the time that it takes n divided by two elements for the second half plus the merge time. But the merge time, it's basically n minus one comparisons because you are looking at the first elements of the both lists. So basically the time that it takes to sort n elements is two times the time that it takes n divided by two elements plus two n minus one. And now you are basically applying this formula for n divided by two. So this will be equal with two, two times two, the time that it takes 
uh, to sort n divided by four elements plus two n divided by two or n divided by two minus one. And again, this applies over and over. And we can see that we have two square t, uh, the time that it takes to sort n divided by four elements plus two n uh, minus two, because you have this two in front and you multiply it with uh, uh, n after two simplifies with two. So it's two n minus two plus two n minus one. So it's two n minus three. Now after k steps, basically where k is logarithm in base two of n, we have n divided by two to the power of logarithm in base two of n, which is t of one. So that's the ending time when we stop. At that time, we will have two to the power k, which is two to the power logarithm in base two of n. Multiply with t of one plus two n minus two to the power log, uh, log to the, uh, of n minus one plus and so on up to two n minus two plus two n minus one. So basically this will simplify to n because two to the power log of n is n plus two uh, n multiply with log of n. So it's two n n uh, log of n times because it's k times every single time we had two n minus two to the power log, uh, log, log of n plus one. But out of these, the one that grows the most is n. So this is, will be two uh, n multiply with log of n plus one, which is n log n log linear, uh, uh, linear time for Mercer. And that's why we got such a good time because suddenly log of uh, 100,000 became 16. And we just executed 16 multiply with 100,000 steps instead of 100,000 square. So our program is basically much faster. Any questions about MERSORT? So the next algorithm, QuickSort, was invented by uh, Tony Huare in 1962. It was in fact his uh, PhD thesis, but it's very easy to understand now after these many years. Uh, uh, I actually saw him last year in Oxford and he basically uh, talked, uh, he was at a special talk on uh, logic programming, but he actually mentioned the fact that now it's much more complicated than it used to be many years ago. So the algorithm selects an element called the pivot in the array, usually the first element. Then you divide the array into two parts such that you have in the first part the elements that are less than the pivot and in the second part the elements that are greater than the pivot. You apply this recursively on the sub element, sub arrays. So now you have another subarray and you split it into less and greater and less and greater. And you always put the pivot between the two sets, the ones that are less than it and the, the ones that are greater than it. And you apply it until you get two elements and basically the pivot will be either swapped with that, uh, the second element or left in place. And your set will be sorted. So really consider the partition first. So the partition is the following. You get a random array. You consider the first element to be the pivot. Like for instance, five is set to be the pivot. And then you have the, the index low for the next element after the pivot and the index high for the last element. You compare low with high. You basically compare each low with pivot and high with pivot. Uh, but you basically start from the beginning and you, need, you search forward and backwards for those elements that are greater than the pivot for low and less than the pivot for high. So for instance, we find that two was less than five, it's okay, it's in the right position, but nine is greater than five. So you basically move the low index to the first position where you find an element that is greater than five. Similarly for high, basically 
7 was greater than 5, it's okay. 6 was greater than 5, it's okay. 1 is the first element that is not greater than 5. What do, we, do you do in this case? You swap the two elements, the element at index low with the element at index high. So basically the element at index low now is 1, which is less than 5, and the element at index high is 9, which is greater than 5. And you continue the process. So 3 is less than 5, 8 is not. So you basically uh, move low to point as an index to 8. Similarly, 9 was greater than 5, but 0 is not greater than 5. So now high will point to 0. And you do the same operation, you swap them. So 0 becomes at index low and 8 becomes at index high. And you continue this process. So 4 is less than 5, so you move low to 8. And 8 was greater than 5, so you move high to 4. And now you basically found where five should be. So at this point, you swap four with five and five is in the right order. So basically, you know now that five, all the elements before five are less than five and after five are greater than five. So five is in the right order and you can do quick sort on the first half and quick sort on the second half after five because the pivot at this point is in the right order. So this is exactly what happens. Like if you are given an array and you chose five as the pivot and you apply that algorithm for iterating both from the end and from the beginning and swapping the elements and then swapping the low element, uh, basically the last element in the first list with the pivot, you get five in the right place and then you are left to sort the beginning half and the second half. And you can apply the same algorithm for the beginning half. So you choose four as the pivot and eight as the pivot. And again, you look at all the elements. So two is less than five, than four, one is less than four, three is less than four, zero is less than four. So at this point, you swap zero with four and four is in the right position. Similarly for eight, eight is uh, uh, not greater than nine. So low will be pointing to nine high will be pointing to uh, seven. You swap them and then you continue the algorithm. Six is uh, not less than, uh, it's less than eight. So you continue nine is less than eight and you leave it in that order. So it's going, basically you continue the uh, sorting on uh, six and seven. So this is how you basically apply this algorithm. And here are a few steps in the first half that after you consider four as the pivot, zero is now at the beginning and now you basically have, you consider zero as the pivot in the rest of the array, but zero is actually the smallest. So it's left in place. You consider two as the pivot and now two is swapped with one and now the partial array is sorted. And again, I implemented it. So quick sort is implemented here. And I implemented it as follows. So basically I pass the list and uh, to the quick sort method and the quick sort method uses a helper method where the pivot is chosen as being the first element and we need to partition the entire list into uh, the first elements and the last elements. Uh, then we quick sort the first elements and we quick sort the last elements uh, on the same list. So the advantage of quick sort is that you don't need to change the list. You only need to send the indices of the beginning and the end of the sub list that you are basically working on. So in each case, the partition is actually the main method. So what partition does, it saves first the element at index first as the pivot. Then the index of first plus one is low index and the index high is assigned the last index. As long as high is greater than low, you search forward from the left as long as a list 
of flow is less than the pivot. You stop the moment, you don't increment low the moment that list of low is not less than equal with pivot. You also search backwards from the right. So basically now you're moving high and you're moving it as long as list, uh, list of high is greater than the pivot. The moment that this is not true, we don't decrement i. The moment that we basically reached an element that is greater than the pivot as low and less than pivot as high, we swap them. So as long as the indices high is greater than low, a temporary variable is assigned the element at index high, the element at index high is assigned the element at index low, and the element at index low is assigned temp. You also have to account for duplicates and, and, and skip them. So as long as high is greater than first and list of high is greater than equal with the pivot, you decrement high. This only accounts for duplicate elements. You basically uh, want to skip them before you, you uh, put the pivot in the right place. So at this position high, now we can insert the pivot. And as, if the pivot is greater than the list of high, the first element is assigned the list of i, the element at index i is assigned the pivot, and we return the index of that pivot. So the overall implementation is basically based on, on this. Uh, we do the partition, and then we do the quick sorts on the each halves and uh, the elements will be in sorted order. So this example, if we want to try it. So merge sort took us uh, 27 milliseconds for 100,000 ele 100, elements and uh, quick sort takes about the same time. Now, complexity wise is not quite true. So, First of all, the partition. This method takes an array of n elements and partitions them in elements less than the pivot, the pivot, and the elements greater than the pivot. And for that, it does n comparisons. It starts from the beginning and finds all the elements that are less than, from the end, all the elements that are greater than. And it does all of these comparisons and swaps when needed, but this is in the size of n because basically in the worst case, we'll have to do n moves and n, n minus one comparisons. The worst case complexity is that basically at each time the pivot divides the array into a big subarray and the other one which is uh, empty. So the size of the big subarray is one less than the one that is being divided all the time. So in the worst case, the algorithm will take n minus one steps because you are taking an array, you leave the element, the pivot in place, and then you have to sort the rest of the array. And which has n minus two, uh, n minus one elements. So again, you do n minus two comparisons and so on up to one, which again boils down to a quadratic time O of m square. But the best case is the scenario in which the pivot divides the array into two sides which are about the same size. So at every step you pay the price of n. But if the pivot div divides the array into two halves, then t of n for the time required to quick sort an array of n elements would be the time that it takes half of the, 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 the array plus the other half of the array, plus the time of the partition. And this recurrence formula, we saw it before, is basically n log n. Because at every step, we divide by two and we do it as many steps as we have log in base two of n. Then we stop. So in the end, we have basically n log n operations, that uh, a log n of n operations that will be executed. The average time complexity is the same. So we didn't talk much about average time complexity, but what, I see, what in average, an array is unsorted with equal probability of elements being placed in any position, which really means that uh, basically at every division, you choose a random pivot, like the first element, 
it's equal probability that half of the array is less than the pivot and half of the array is greater than the pivot. So in that case, the same formula applies at every step. So really for uh, uh, average time is the same n log n. The advantage of quick sort to merge sort is the fact that it doesn't need any kind of copying. We were doing all of these operations that we saw with indices on the same initial array. So in both cases, we do basically half of the array, uh, but in merge sort, we'll need a secondary temporary array to do the sorting. So quick sort is more space efficient than merge sort. So one more thing. So quick sorting in the average case, when we have some random array, it's basically uh, as fast as uh, merge sort. But if you want to implement the best, the uh, worst case complexity, you would basically need a for loop that iterates from the size, let's say minus one, as long as i is greater than zero, greater than equal, i minus minus, and a of i in this case will be exactly in opposite order. So we start with the smallest, actually why don't we start from the beginning? So if they are in the right order, then we have the worst case complexity. So for that array, I had an error, stack error. Basically it's uh, the problem need now is the fact that I'm running out of stack for 10,000. And the reason why is that actually it's that deep. Before we were having a log number of calls because you have a tree that all the time finishes on the right branch. But right now we have the elements in order. So basically it means that it calls, the next recursive call is for Nine, 99,999 and the next recursive call is for 99,998 and so on. So really the worst case, you can't even represent it with the stack that we have available. Good, any questions? Nothing in the chat. Okay, the next method that we will talk about sorting is uh, basically based on heaps. But before we talk about heaps, let me tell you what a binary tree is. A binary tree is a hierarchical structure. It's either empty or it consists of an element called a root and two distinct binary subtrees, the left subtree and the right subtree. The length of a path from a node is the number of edges, edges in that path. The depth of a node is a uh, the length of the path from uh, the root to that node. Okay. So a complete binary tree is a full binary tree, basically up to some depth, let's say D, such that uh, the last level may not be full, but all of the leaves are in the last level are placed leftmost. So for instance, what we have here on the left is a, it's a, binary, a complete binary tree. This is also a, bi a complete binary tree. Basically, it's a complete tree where all the levels are full, except the last level, which is uh, uh, all the nodes on the last level are placed on the left hand side. So this is a complete binary tree. These are not complete binary trees this one because the second level, which is not the last level is not complete. And this one, no, because the last level, the nodes are not uh, left, most left placed. Uh, so it's not basically a complete tree. A binary heap is a binary tree with the properties that is a complete binary tree. Basically uh, it's either like this or like this, it's packed up to the last level and the last level is back to the left. 
but with also another condition that each node is greater than equal with its children. So is this a binary heap? Yes, because 42 is greater than 32 and 39, 32 is greater than 22 and 29, and 39 is greater than 14 and 33. This is not a heap, and the reason why is that we look at 39 and it's not greater than 42. So this is not a heap. A heap must be a complete binary tree, and each node must be greater than its children, and by transitivity, then all of the other nodes under it. Heap sort uses a binary heap, and how does it use it? It actually adds the elements to the heap and then removes them from the top. And we always get in the top is the largest element because by transitivity is greater than all of the other elements. So if I remove the element from the top and then I basically do re-balancing uh, that tree and we'll see how to do that, I basically get a, a binary heap. So a binary sort, the way that we will learn it, it adds all the elements to a heap and then removes them one by one from the top and it, uh, it obtains a sorted list that way. And it's very useful for sorting and priority queues. So how do we store a heap before we talk about how do we do adding and removing elements from a heap? We can store a heap in an array list or in an array with the size of uh, that heap, if the size of the heap is known in advance. Like for instance, we said that the maximum heap is 10,000 elements or 100,000 elements. Now for a position I, the left child is at position two I plus one and the right child is at position two I plus two. And the parent for the child with node I is i minus one divided by two. For instance, let's look at the root. The root is at index zero. Now its children will be put at index two multiplied with zero plus one, so it's one, and two multiplied with zero plus two. So the children of uh, 62 are 42 and 59. So basically we put them in the right positions. For 42, its left child will be at index 2i plus 1, so 2 plus 1 is 3, so its left child will be at index 32, and right child will be at index 2i plus 2, so 2 multiplied with, 40, with 1 plus 2 is 39, it's uh, 4, it's, here is 39. For no matter what, ele so basically, you can consider that the heap is stored in an array because every parent has the children into precise positions that follow it and the parents at precise uh, positions which is i minus one divided with two so no matter so first of all as you add elements to the heap you have a, uh, the heap stored as an array and if you want to remove elements, you will basically have to rearrange the, the heap. And I will show you how to do that. So how do we add elements to the heap? The algorithm is as follows. To add an element to the heap, you first add it at the end of the heap, and then you compare it with its parent. So let the last element to be the current node. While the current node is greater than its parent, swap the current node with the parent, and now the current node is one level up and repeat. So basically in this while loop, you repeat again, you look at that node and the parent and swap them if necessary. Let me show you an example. I want to add 88 to a heap that already contains 22, 11, 19, 3, 5, and 1. So this was the previous heap, the heap that didn't contain 88, and I want to add 88. First of all, I place 88 in the next available position in the heap, which happens to be the last element of the third level. I compare 88 with its pair 19, and because it's greater than 19, I swap them. Now I compare 88, the current element, with 22, and because it's greater than 22, I swap them. 
And now I don't have any more parents, so I basically added an element to the heap. I obtained the new heap that contains 88. So here are examples. If I give you random numbers, like I'm basically give you 3, 5, 1, 19, 11, 22, you can start adding them to the heap. So initially is only three in the heap, then five will be added as the child of three. And because five is greater than three, they swap. Then we want to add one, one will be added as the next child and is less than its parents. So we leave it in place. Then we want to add 19. So first 19 will be post put after three as the left child. It will be swapped with three and it will be swapped with five. So we are getting this heap as the next state. Then we want to add 11. So first we add 11 as the child of 15 or five. And because it's greater than five, we swap it with five. So we get this heap. Then we want to add uh, 22. So 22 is added as the left child of one and it swaps one with 22 and 19 with uh, 22 and we get this heap. So we can basically do insertion in the heap in log of the number of elements in the heap. So basically this, the depth of this tree because the tree is complete, it will be log of, uh, because at every branch you split into two is log in base two of how many elements you added to the heap. So adding an element is log of n. Removing an element. Basically, we want to remove the root, always the biggest element in the heap, and rearrange the heap. So how do we do this operation? We basically, first thing, we move the last node to replace the root that we deleted. We let the root to be the current node, and while the current node has children, we, and the current node is smaller than one of the children, we swap the current node with the larger of the two children. So let's say that five had one and seven. We swap seven with uh, five, and now we continue at five and look at its children. So at the, every level, we look at two children, choose the maximum, that is greater than five than the current element and swap them. If it's greater than both, you're stopping because there is nothing else to be done. You have a heap. So let's say that I want to remove 62 from this heap. This is a heap at every level. The, root, the parent is greater than his children. So 62 is greater than 42 and 59. 42 is greater than 32 and 39. 59 is greater than 44 and 13 and so on. So I remove 62 and I put nine as the root. So basically that's the first step of removing the root. But now nine is less than both 42 and 59. So I'm gonna swap it with the maximum of 42 and 59. So now nine is that child to the right. Nine is again less than 44 and 13. So I'm going to swap it again with 44. Nine is also less than 30 and 17. So I'm going to swap it with 30. And I got a, a, a heap because at this level, every node is greater than his children. We haven't done anything on this branch. And on this branch, we always put a maximum as the current node. Removing a root, an element out of the heap, which is the root, is also log of n because it takes from takes the last element, puts it first, and then at every step it does, does two comparisons with the two children and gets the bigger one and swap it and continues from that position. So let's first implement it and then we, it's, we, we are going to do its complexity. So we implement a heap with an array list. Really easy. Basically, uh, an array list will contain a heap. Uh, and there are methods to uh, take an array or they take uh, no elements and create a heap. And then we have methods to add an element to the heap, which is done in log n time to remove an element from the heap and get the size of the heap. So this is basically the, the heap. We have an array list that can, will contain the heap then a method that takes an array of elements and calls add 
on every element, so it adds them to the heap. The add method implements that algorithm that we saw before, that we basically add the new object as the last element of the array list of the heap. The current index is list of size minus one, the, the index of the last node that we added to the heap. If the, while the current is greater than zero, parent index is assigned current index minus one divided by two. So basically we take the index of the parent. If the current, the element at the current index is greater than with the element at the parent index, we have to swap them. So we basically, uh, we are, uh, we, we take the, we create a temporary element that create, that stores the element at the current index. We set in that list, the element at the current index to be the element at index parent index. And we set the element at index parent index, the current element. And we continue the while loop basically this happens while the current index is still greater than zero. So the tree will stop to be a heap the moment that this while condition basically uh, stops being true. Removing an element from the uh, heap, we remove always the root and we put the, first the last element to be the first. So first of all, if the size will be zero, we return null because we remove the last element from the heap. Otherwise, the removed object is the element at index zero, that's the root. We set the element at index zero to be the element at index list dot size minus one, and we remove that last element. Now with the while loop, we do the following. The current element index is compared with the size of the list. E, the, left has the left child will be two multiply with the current index plus one, and the right child is two multiply with the current index plus two. That those was the formulas to obtain the two children. Find the maximum between the two children and also compare them with the element at the current index. So if the list, the left child index is greater than the size, then you stop because the tree is uh, a heap. Otherwise, the maximum index is assigned the left child index. The right child index is less than the, uh, as long as if the right child index is less than the uh, size of the list, then the element at index get max index, we compare it with the element at index right child, and the max index is assigned the right child index. Uh, now we basically swap if we need to. If the current element, uh, the current index is less than the element at, uh, the element at maximum index, we, uh, uh, we swap them. We assign to temp the element at maximum index. We set the element at maximum index to build the element at the current index and the current index with temp. And this basically guarantees that after we do the uh, basically uh, removal of the element up to a level, it will be a heap. So heap sort, I told you that it basically uses a heap. So how does it uses a heap? Basically we create a heap, we iterate over all of the elements that we want to sort and we add them to the heap and then we iterate over the heap and we remove one element at a time uh, with the method remove, basically, which removes the element at index zero, the top of the heap all the time. So if you apply it on this array, it basically, uh, it basically sorts the array in order. And this is the same example for 100,000 elements, it takes 76 milliseconds. Any questions about uh, heap sort? So in this example, I basically, I have to create an array of integers because I need to compare them. I have to put the elements in a, in, in a, in a, a heap, in a binary uh, tree. So let's create an integer array. Let's call it B. And this is a new integer array of the same size with A. 
and we need to copy the elements from A into B. And we can just do it with boxing. So B of A is I is equal with A of I. And now if we call uh, hip sort on B, it will basically do hip sort in 90 milliseconds, very fast. Okay. Hip sort is just the sorting that uses a hip. Uh, basically we create a hip and we do sorting on it and the hip contains remove and add. So this is basically in the, in the lecture notes if you want. Okay. So now what's the time for sorting a hip? First of all, we need to find the depth of the hip. So if H is the height of the hip of N elements, since the hip is a complete binary tree, it means that the first level has one node, the second level has two nodes, the next level has two to the power two nodes and two to the power three nodes, the next level and so on. Up to the last level, which may have between one and uh, two to the power h minus one nodes. So the number of nodes is greater than the sum of two, one plus two plus up to two to the power a, uh, h minus two, and less than equal with one plus two up to two to the power h minus one. Now, this is a geometric series. So we know that this is equal with two to the power h minus one minus one. And this summation is two to the power h minus one because it's again a geometric series is the sum of powers uh, of the base two up to h minus one, it will be two to the power h minus one. Now, if you add one, you get that two to the power h minus one is less than n plus one, which is less than two to the power h. And now you can apply logarithm on all of these values and you get the logarithm in base two of two to the power h minus one is less than logarithm of n plus one, the number of nodes, and is less than a logarithm of two to the power h, which is equal with h and similarly uh, logarithm in of two of the power h minus one is h minus one. So basically the height of the tree is uh, greater than uh, logarithm of uh, n plus one and less than logarithm of n plus one plus one. So basically the height of the tree is about logarithm in base two of n. So the height of the heap is at most logarithm in base two of n. Adding and removing elements to the heap is done in the number of steps on one branch. So the adding was basically that we add it as the last node in the heap. And then we have to iterate over the nodes up to the root and swap them if they are necessary. So it will take at most logarithm of n steps, the height of the heap. Uh, does the number of the time that it's, it takes to insert the elements in the heap is n multiplied with log of n because to insert every element it would take at most log n. We have to insert n elements, it takes n log n. To remove elements, you remove the root and then you put the last element as the root and you swap them with the children which is also in the size of h, the height of the heap, because basically uh, you only compare at every step with two children and choose the maximum and do a swap. And then you continue at the next level with one element each. So the, the time that it takes to construct the heap is n log n, and the time that it takes to remove the elements and get them in sorted order is also n log n. So the heap sort time, since the removal method is invoked n times and every time it takes log n, it's n log n. So again, the same difference between merge sort and heap sort. That merge sort requires an additional array for basically sorting. Heap sort doesn't require additional space. So it's more space efficient than merge sort. Any questions about heap sort? 
bucket sort and radix sort. So all the sorting algorithms that we learned up to now apply to any kind of keys because we basically didn't look at what's the size of a number or what's the length of a string and so on. Now, bucket so so all of those algorithms we saw that the best times algorithms that we could get were n log n. No sorting algorithms were basically based on comparisons can do better than n log n. However, if the keys are small integers, we can use bucket sort and radix sort. And I will show you what exactly they are next. Bucket sort is basically a step that says if you can partition the elements into different buckets based on some key that you get from the elements and then collect them the buckets in order, you can get a sorted order over those buckets. So the bucket sort works as follows. You have t plus one buckets, which are labeled from zero to t. And the keys that you can get for every element are also from zero to t. Like for instance, if you consider that uh, the buckets are 10 buckets with digits from zero to nine, what you want is a get key method that gives you for any element uh, uh, an index, uh, uh, a key from zero to nine. So if you get, you, you take all the elements and you get the key out of these elements, you can basically distribute the elements into the buckets. So you have buckets from zero to T and then for every element you get a key and you put the element in the correct bucket and then you take the, bucket, the elements out in the same order and you put them in the original array. You can use an array list to implement each bucket. So you have basically an array list to, uh, first you have an array and then in each array you have as an element an array list for the elements in that bucket. So you can use array list to implement a bucket element and the, all the buckets into an array. The algorithm that I have in the lecture notes is a little bit different than the one that you have in the textbook. So, because the one in the textbook doesn't work, it's basically something is wrong with it. Uh, and I can show you exactly where it's wrong. Uh, the fact that it assigns to an array of elements E an array list, which is impossible. So the algorithm that I have here basically says the following. I have an array of buckets. So every bucket is an array list. So a bucket or all the buckets are an array of array lists of elements of the type E. And we assign to this uh, bucket an array list of T plus one elements. Or basically an array of T plus one elements, each element will be an array list. First thing, we want to distribute the elements into the buckets. So we iterate from zero to the length of the list and assume that each method, each element has a method get key, which basically gives me uh, the key for that element. If the element at index key in my array buckets is null, then bucket of key is assigned a new array list. And we add to that array list at index key, the element that we basically had the key uh, key. And we iterate over all the elements. So basically what it happens, we take all of the list and we distribute some elements in each one of the buckets. Then we iterate over the buckets. So we start from zero to the length of the buckets, T basically. And if the bucket is not null, then we iterate over the elements in the bucket from zero to the size of the bucket and we put them back into the list. So list of K plus plus is assigned the element at index uh, J in the bucket I. Okay. So let me show you directly how this works. So let's assume that the key is the last index. So the elements that I have here are distributed based on the last index, the last digit in the, in the, in the, in the integer. 
into a bucket. So 331 is distributed bucket one because the last digit is one. 445 is distributed at index four. Uh, 230 is distributed at index zero because the last digit is zero. So basically you are looking at the last digit and you put the elements in the original list into those buckets. And then you remove the elements from the buckets in order of the buckets. So 230 will be first, then 331 and 231, then 343 and 453 and so on. So you first distribute them by the last digit into buckets with the index being that last digit. And then you collect them back into uh, uh, the original array. And you do the, again the operation in the case of radix sort on the second digit. So 230 will be put now in the bucket three and 331 also in the bucket three and 231 also in the bucket three, 343 into the bucket four. So you're looking at the second element, but this is done in radix sort. So bucket sort is only one step in, in this process. It basically is in radix sort. It takes one, uh, it takes a list of buckets of size of t and it basically distributes the elements into those buckets based on the key returned for a given radix or basically for, uh, for the key out of that element and then it collects the elements back into the original list. This is bucket sort. Bucket sort is not enough for sorting integers. So basically what we did in bucket sort, we took uh, the time of O plus T, uh, of N plus T. Basically we took N elements, we distributed them to T buckets, and then we collected the elements back from the buckets into the original list. If the number of buckets is too large, then bucket sort is not desirable because if the t is too large then you have too many buckets and when you iterate with uh, the last loop over the bucket length the length of the number of t you basically can see that you are paying the price of t which if it's bigger than n it doesn't make sense instead you can use radix sort which i will show you how the radix sort is based on the bucket sort but it uses only 10 buckets and it works for integers. So there is one property that we have to remember about bucket sort. It's stable, meaning that if two elements in the original list have the same key value, their order is not changed in the sorted list. So if we apply bucket sort on two elements that have like 331 and uh, 231, uh, and they have the same value three for the second element, they will be put in the same order, 331, 231 in the bucket and then collected in the same order in, uh, uh, when we restore the elements from the bucket. So that's a property that we, it's used for, for radix sort. If two elements E1 and E2 have the same key, after you put them in the bucket and you remove them from the bucket, they are still in order. So now radix sort works for integers. The idea for radix sort is to do the bucket sort on radix, on the uh, every digit, one at a time. So on digit zero, radix zero, radix one, radix two. So you apply bucket sort repeatedly from the lowest digit to the highest digit in your array, okay? So how does it work? We take a random array of integers. We do bucket sort on the last digit. So 331 is put in bucket one, 440, 454 in bucket four and so on, based on the last digit. So the last digit is the one that is considered, let's bold it and underline it for doing bucket sort in the first step, okay? And we repeat it up to basically the last element. So for instance, nine will be put on in the last bucket. So 
So once you put them into buckets, you now collect them from the buckets with buckets sort uh, into the original list. So 230 will be the first element, 331 the second element, and so on up to nine as the last element. Then you do bucket sort again on the second digit. So three, 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 four, five, five, three, four, four, five, and zero. Basically, you can consider that nine is preceded by a zero. And they are distributed again on uh, their corresponding buckets. Nine will be distributed to zero, 59 into uh, five, into the bucket for uh, five here and so on. But you do it from the beginning. You again collect them. So now basically you get nine into the first position, uh, 230 into the next position and so on. And you do bucket sort again on the third digit. So nine will be basically, it's like preceded by two zeros. So it's really, it will be put in the first bucket. Uh, 230 will be put into the bucket with index two. And so on, every element is put in the correct bucket uh, based on the third digit. Okay, so here is a zero, here we have three, here we have four, here we have four, and the last one we have zero. Let's put a zero here. It's too big, so we leave it as six. And then we collect again the bucket. What do you observe? That when we collect the last bucket, we basically have the elements in sorted order. 9, 34, 45, 59, and so on. So basically what happened with bucket sort is that we basically sorted on every digit, but because of this property of uh, stability, next time you sort, you sort on the next digit and you put them in order. Next time you sort on the next digit and you put them in order. So given the radix, the, num the maximum number of digits that you can have in these integers, you did that number of sortings of n steps each, and then you basically collected the results and they are in sorted order. So radix sort basically takes D, which is the radix, the number of maximum number of digits, multiply with N, because you do two copies. Uh, in every case, you copy the elements into the buckets, N, and you copy the elements N back into the original array. So basically the radix sort would take D multiply with N to sort N integers uh, with N, uh, N, integer, uh, N integers with keys with basically uh, the maximum radix. So I implemented this again, and I put the solution in the uh, lecture notes, sorting, and it's a simple radix sort that is implemented as follows. I'm looking, looking, uh, looking, uh, doing bubble sort, uh, bucket sort, and the key is set in a variable radix. So what, it's, what I'm doing, I'm dividing up to that radix by 10, collecting the quotients, and then I'm doing remainder after division with 10, which takes the, the value as that key. So bucket sort that is defined below takes an integer array, creates an array of uh, array lists bucket of a, a t plus one array list, t being the number of uh, buckets that we have. In this case, actually I should have had 10, but I have 11. Uh, I, this can be assigned nine, in fact, and it's working fine. Then in a for loop, I distribute the, the elements to the correct buckets. So for every element in the list, I'm getting the key, which is basically based on the radix. It starts from zero and goes up to the last digit. And in my case, I'm doing it for six because this is 100,000. 
So up to six, I'm doing radix assigned and then bucket sort. And the bucket sort basically iterates, puts all the elements in the correct buckets and then collects the elements back into the list. And uh, uh, I collect ba basically the elements back into the list. And again, if you want to test it, all that you need to do is to run the example that we have and it takes 52 milliseconds in this case. If you want to actually see if it, this is correct, let's do it for a smaller array, maybe an array of 20, and also print the elements of the array after we finish the program. So for every integer i, i is less than a dot length, and system dot out print a of i plus a space and bucket sort sorts the elements in the correct order we can actually see that the elements are sorted so radi radix sort actually works and the time is in case that d is uh, less than logarithmic base 2 of n is better than uh, 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 basically standard methods like uh, uh, merge sort Any questions? Wow, no questions today. Good, external sort. All of the algorithms that we discussed in the preceding sections, uh, the data has to be entirely available in memory. So we have to store it as an array. But what do you do when you have a huge file that you cannot store, you cannot bring that data into uh, uh, memory and sort it? Let's say that you have a file of a billion elements or a trillion elements, a lot of elements, you cannot store them. In that case, if this file is too large, what you can do is basically sort that much that you can sort at one step. So repeatedly bring into memory uh, one window of elements from the file, sort them and store them into a temporary file. That's in phase one. In phase two, you want to merge the sorted subarrays. And this is really the algorithm of merging that we saw in the case of merge sort, that you take the two subarrays that are sorted, you compare the first elements and you sort them into the, into the sorted order. But how do you actually do this merging if you cannot load the entire array? You don't need to load the entire array. So actually what you can do is this. You can copy half of the array into a new location. Then you load the first blocks, like the first block and the first block, do sort, uh, merge sorting, uh, merging on the, the first elements. So basically if the elements at, uh, from the beginning of S5 with the elements from the beginning of S1 and put them into the new array in sorted order and continue even if this this basically this whole thing is sorted let's say that you stop at some index here and you finish s1 continue with s2 so you basically in the end you have everything sorted correctly the complexity of that is basically in the in the number of input outputs input outputs are more expensive than reading from main memory sometimes with two or three orders of magnitude. So if it takes, let's say, a nanosecond to read from cache or main memory, it takes a hundred nanoseconds or even a millisecond to uh, read and write to the disk or to even flash memory. Flash is basically persistent memory, but as fast as or as close as possible in speed with uh, main memory. So assume that you have n elements to sort in that huge file. You have a huge file of a billion elements and you want to sort them. In phase one, you need to sort them into buckets. And of course, if n is the number of input outputs, the, the, the time that it takes you to sort a bucket, which let's say a bucket has a size of C, C log C is much smaller than the number of copies C that you have to do. So 
really n is the, the cost that you pay in input outputs. So the time of in input outputs for phase one, which is sorting sub sub lists is really uh, uh, in, the, in the time of copying them and storing them back into temporary files. So it's O of N. In phase two, you first split, you have a, a number of initial segments which are sorted. Basically N divided by C initial segments. C is the number of segments that we basically sorted in the first step. So now, if we have n divided by c segments, each merge step reduces the number of segments by two. So if you have n divided by c segments, you have n divided by a c multiplied with one divided by two uh, number of segments in the next step. So n divided by two multiplied with c. If you have n divided by two multiplied with c number of segments in the previous step, in the next step, you will have n divided by 2c multiplied with 1 over 2 number of segments, which is n divided by 2 square c. How many times you apply this? Until 2, 2 to the power k is equal with n, because then it's when you stop. Then it's when you have 1, and that's it. So after the third step, you have n divided by 2 to the power 3 multiplied with c. After n divided by c uh, log n divided by c steps, you basically stop, you got to one. So therefore the number of merge steps that you have to do is log of n divided by c. Now in this step, you basically also pay at every moment n input outputs. You have to copy the elements from one file, half of the elements into another file, and then do merging, which is also n. So how many times you do it, you do it n, O of n multiply with log in base two of n divided by C. And after you simplify, you uh, simplify with the non dominating constants, you get n log n number of steps. And in the lecture notes, I basically put code to create huge files of uh, about one trillion, eight trillion elements, and then the entire program to sort these files which will take quite a while if you want to implement them. So these are also available in the lecture notes. First, it creates a huge file and prints the first 100 elements, and then it sorts it in the way that I described. Any questions? Can you still hear me? Okay, so basically that's all for today as lecture. Actually, that's not true. I also want to go over the quiz for the day. So in the quiz for the day, I'm basically giving you recurrence relations like T of N is equal with T of N divided by two plus O of one. And you have to find out what is the uh, big O notation for that. So for this case, this is uh, uh, basically logarithmic time and an example of such an algorithm. Binary search is such an example because at every step, you do one operation, one comparison with element in the middle in that sorted array, and then you discard half of the array. So the problem becomes to sort the other half, to find the correct position in the other half. So binary search is an example of this complexity, which is logarithmic. The next, uh, another example is the GCD with Euclidean algorithm. It was also logarithmic time and the same recurrence relation. Next one is T of N is equal with T of N minus one plus O of one. This is linear search. Basically you do one comparison with the current element and then you continue with the rest of the elements in the same order. Uh, T of N is equal with two multiplied with T of N divided by two plus O of one. It's basically an algorithm, let's say for printing, that you print the element in the middle and then you have to print the other two halves. So basically this is a, such an example that you start from low and high. If low is equal with high, you print the element at low and then you return. Otherwise you call print of 
the list from low to the middle and from the middle to the end. So this is basically an example of such an algorithm. Uh, this algorithm is t of n is equal with 2 t of n divided by 2 plus o of n. So this is a log linear time, which the example is the minimum distance in, we divide and conquer that we saw in the lecture notes last time. Basically, we have to do the minimum distance in the two halves and then in the strip in the middle. The next one is t of n is equal with t of n minus 1 plus o of n. Uh, selection sort is such an algorithm, insertion sort. Basically, at every step, you have to do a sort of n to find the maximum, and then you have to sort the rest of the array. t of n is equal with 2, two multiply with t of n minus 1 plus o of 1. That was Towers of Hanoi you have to move n minus one blocks, then move the last block to the other peg, then move again n minus one blocks. And the complexity for that is exponential two to the power n. T of n is equal with T of n minus one plus T of n minus two plus O of one. That's Fibonacci, is also logarithmic time. And uh, here is the proof that after you expand it, you will expand it two to the power n times. We have a better proof in the lecture notes. And in the, in the lecture, in the lab today, you have to implement generic bubble sort. So the bubble sort that I implemented in the lecture notes is uh, for integers. Now you have to do it for uh, uh, any type of element E and same for merge sort and same for quick sort. That's the end of the lecture.